ITIL, IT Service Continuity Management. Well, as you know, Service Continuity is one of the five books of the ITI Library version 3. Now, even though the previous two movies covered primarily service design topics, capacity management, availability management, these also have some overlap with service continuity, or as some call it, disaster recovery. And it makes sense, because if capacity is not there, and if systems aren't reliable, available, and resilient, then IT services can't consistently continue. Now, going back to the firefighter analogy, service continuity slash disaster recovery should really be about 90% planning and prevention, and hopefully 10% or much less actual event response. By the way, we're very close to the finish line, so you might be tempted to kind of rush through these final two nugget movies, but please don't do it. If you think about service continuity management, disaster recovery, and security management, that makes up a huge chunk of a corporate security policy. So you really don't want to rush through these last two movies. It's all extremely viable and important information and critical to your success as an ITIL professional. So without further ado, let's take a look at IT service continuity management. In this nugget, we're going to get an overview, first of all, of IT service continuity management. Then, we'll look at different types or categories of disasters. We'll take a look at the four-phase process of ITSCM. And then finally, some costs and potential pitfalls of security continuity management. Well, as I've already mentioned, Continuity management is also referred to as disaster recovery. And actually, this refers more to the ongoing planning process, planning and training to effectively respond to major disruptions in your business and IT infrastructure. This involves working towards an IT service continuity plan, defining the steps necessary to recover one or more IT services. This plan is also going to focus on the things that will trigger an official response or an escalated disaster. It will also look at the people that are involved and the communication process as well. It should be part of, and as we're going to look at this later on, it's going to be part of a business continuity plan. So you, could, you can look at this as uh, circles that are overlapping, okay? It consists of business continuity planning and overall continuity planning. Remember, a disaster, this goes well beyond just an incident or a problem. We're talking about something that can actually stop the operation of our business or organization. So in a nutshell, IT service continuity management is an overall process that's responsible for controlling and managing all of the risks and vulnerabilities that could seriously impact IT services in general. At the very least, we want to make sure that your IT service provider is going to provide at least the minimum level you know, of agreed service levels, the lowest common denominator. Anything less than that really falls into the category of a disaster. Like I mentioned, like a firefighter, the emphasis is going to be on disaster prevention and avoidance of the disaster instead of what we're going to do to handle all the many disasters that we're going to be dealing with. So we're going to support the overall business continuity management, which is a higher level process that's going to involve people way up in the organizational flow chart or the org chart, however you want to look at it. It deals also, to a lesser degree, with actual restoration and recovery of IT services. So the bottom line is if a disaster occurs, you want to do three things. One, we want to make sure that we can manage the recovery of our services and our systems. Two, we want to make sure that we lose less service availability time and provide better continuity to the users in case of a disaster. And three, minimize any interruptions to the business activities. You know, no one likes to think about the different ways you can, you know, collapse your business and run into catastrophic problems, but you do need to sit down sometimes and do inventory on the different types and categories of disasters that are out there. Part of the process of risk assessment is kind of looking at uh, where your company is, its location, 
weather patterns, history, and find out the types of disasters that can occur to your business, to your organization. So we want to understand the different categories here, different types of disasters. Of course, fire is a big one. Uh, flood, and not just flooding from, let's say, uh, storms or a hurricane, but also water damage that can be done with, you know, broken pipes, water heater problems, things like that. Uh, lightning is another disaster. This can cause physical damage and, of course, electrical problems as well uh, to all of your systems. Tornado is a disaster, but also just simply high winds as well. Uh, along with winds, people don't usually uh, realize that dust storms, not just the wind that comes with dust storms, but the dust itself can also wreak havoc on systems. So you might want to put along with wind uh, dust storms. Burglary, obviously theft of equipment, theft of software, theft of intellectual property, uh, corporate secrets, all these things would be a disaster. Vandalism, overall violent acts, uh, maybe murder in the workplace to, uh, that happens, uh, suicide in the workplace, these types of things can cause lots of problems for morale. They can cause bringing in levels of law enforcement that we really don't want to see in our organization. Uh, obviously, uh, as of the late 90s and 2001, we've got problems uh, with terrorism and being able to analyze whether your company is vulnerable to terrorist acts is something you need to, to evaluate uh, very early on in the planning process. Sabotage from competitors or from vandals, sabotage to systems. Uh, this can be uh, come in, the, in the, the form of security attacks. We'll talk about those down here. But security attacks and sabotage, uh, power outages due not only to lightning but due to brownouts or blackouts in your area. Uh, problems on the grid. Uh, brownouts are, aren't total outages, but these are temporary outages of power. Uh, power surges can occur as well. Uh, basic hardware failure, failed power supplies, for example, uh, total system failure to servers and server farms. Security attacks like denial of service attacks on your system and access attacks. Again, we have to deal with internal attacks and external attacks, as well as structured attacks or unstructured attacks. And these are going to be uh, in the form of denial of service attacks and, of course, access attacks, individuals trying to get root level or administrative access to our systems and hardware. These are all types and categories of disasters. These are the type of things you need to evaluate for your company to see if your business is vulnerable, how vulnerable, and what level of risk are you willing to accept to these types of disasters. As you can see from the diagram, IT service continuity management is a four-stage or a four-phase process. The first phase is called initiation. This is where you basically initiate the business continuity management plan or activity. There's really two aspects of that. First of all, you're going to define the scope. Defining the scope of service continuity really involves four aspects. Let me jot these down. When you define the scope, you're going to first define the policy as soon as possible and communicate it throughout your entire organization with management showing a deep commitment to the policy. Then you'll define the scope using relevant areas. You're going to isolate the relevant areas of your organization where continuity and disaster recovery has to be applied. You may also integrate standards like ISO 9000 and BS 7799. These are open standards for general policy principles with approaches and methods for risk assessment and business impact analysis. Then you'll allocate the resources needed to initiate the BCM and then set up the project organization. This is formal project management using possibly a PMP or perhaps using planning software that uses what we call PRINCE2, a project management approach. Once you define the scope, you're ready to initiate the BCM process and move to the second step, which is requirements and strategy. The second phase is looking at the requirements and the strategy that you're going to take for your business impact analysis, your risk assessment, and your overall strategy for IT service continuity. 
You'll identify all the reasons that your organization is including IT service continuity management into the policy and identify the potential impact of all the possible disruptions of services. If your company cannot survive without IT services, then you'll be looking mostly at prevention. If you can survive for a period of time without IT services, then you're going to look primarily at restoring services as your highest priority. Most companies will have to strike a balance between restoration and prevention, and that's where the business impact analysis comes in, isolating the impact of each of the threats and vulnerabilities and disasters that can occur at your company or organization. This means assessing the impact on your services and your overall IT infrastructure. In addition, you're going to perform risk assessment. And this takes a look at all of the potential risks that we saw earlier, the different categories and types of risks, and assessing the vulnerability of your organization and what amount of risk your company is willing to take in a case-by-case -case basis. You want to provide management with valuable information to identify threats and vulnerabilities, as well as the relevant prevention measures and countermeasures that you're going to take. Remember, a disaster recovery plan is usually very expensive. So you should first consider the prevention measures and see if they're within your budget. Sometimes a company will just rely on their insurance as opposed to putting in a disaster recovery plan. Along with risk assessment goes risk analysis, which typically has four steps. Let me jot these down for you. The first step of risk analysis is to identify the relevant assets or IT components. These are things like systems, servers, uh, facilities, data, appliances. Uh, you have to have effective asset identification to make sure that you know who the owner and the purpose of each component is. It must be well documented. Then the second step is to analyze threats. Analyze threats to those documented assets. You also want to estimate the likelihood in terms of maybe high, medium, and low that a disaster will occur and affect that asset. For instance, identifying how an un unreliable power supply or thunderstorms may affect a certain asset. If you live in an area that's prone to flooding or high water, you want to do that as well. The next step, the third step, is to identify and classify the vulnerabilities of each one of those relevant IT components. Identify them, classify them. And then finally, you want to evaluate and estimate the risk of each one of those IT components in the context of risk level. All of these different steps go into the process of risk assessment. Now realize, these are rudimentary and basic approaches and looks at business impact analysis and risk assessment. Those are really huge topics. For the sake of the ITL foundations, you want to have a basic understanding and definition of these particular strategies. So in a nutshell, business impact analysis, or BIA, is the activity of business continuity management that identifies and recognizes critical business functions as well as their dependencies on other components and other IT services. Dependencies may be things like uh, other employees, people, suppliers, processes, services, things like that. In a nutshell, risk assessment is one of the initial steps of risk management, analyzing the value of assets and IT components, determining their value to the business, identifying threats to those assets, and evaluate how vulnerable each asset is to those threats through the process of classification. Risk assessment can be quantitative, in other words, an objective approach based on numerical data, or it can be qualitative, a more subjective approach. The next aspect of the second phase, requirements and strategy, is IT service continuity strategy. Let's talk more about that. Most businesses, when they form a IT service continuity strategy, are going to find that fine line, that delicate balance between recovery planning and reducing risk. And one of the first aspects of strategy will be to elaborate the prevention measures that are available and that will be taken based on the risk analysis, considering all the cost and all the measures and all the different risk levels. These prevention measures are things that 
address earlier risks, for example, of reducing the ability of dust to get into the equipment, protecting against low temperatures or extremely, extremely high temperatures, fire protection, protection against power outages and power surges, burglary, theft, terrorism, all those things. One of the most extensive forms of prevention is shown here on the slide. And this is the stronghold fortress method. This method is going to eliminate most of the problems, most of the vulnerabilities, kind of by building a bunker for your organization, having its own power, its own water supply, etc. The stronghold fortress approach is great for large computer centers that are really too complex for a full-blown recovery plan, like moving to off-site recovery in case of a disaster. Often, organizations will combine a stronghold fortress approach with what's called skirmish capability. Let me jot that down. In other words, having a team in place and the organizational capabilities to find a problem, to isolate it, to go to where the problem is, and then to quickly and promptly deal with it before it spirals out of control. Another key aspect of continuity strategy is to select and choose your recovery options. This means who are the personnel, what people to be part of your disaster recovery team. You need people from all over the organizations with a wide variety of skill sets. What kind of accommodations are you going to have? Alternative sites, alternative facilities, the ability to have it furnished and to transport people, transport services. You need the essential staff in place if you're going to move off-site during disasters. You need to have IT systems in place, separate IT systems and networks, either using portable systems or backup systems support services that includes things like uh, electricity and water telephone services mail services delivery services whether it be ups fedex courier services those kinds of things and the ability to do archiving archiving and storing safely uh, documentation uh, paper-based systems reference materials manuals training manuals copies of all of your software those types of things filing systems what are your viable options for disaster recovery? Well, one option is not to respond at all, which some uh, companies will choose to do, even though very few can afford to do this. Basically, do nothing and wait for the government to come in and fix the problem for you, or let insurance take care of it, those types of things. Another viable option in the case of disaster, let's say you've, got a, you've had a flood or a hurricane, is to go to a paper-based or manual system return to a manual system. Some companies, for example, like State Farm, who I've worked for extensively uh, through IBM, have really aggressively gone to a paperless environment. They still do some paperwork, of course, but they've really tried to move away from that. They simply would have a very difficult time going back to a paper-based system. So for a lot of companies, paper-based systems that have been used in the past just simply won't be available. But this is a fairly viable short-term option for some companies. Also, you can rely on a reciprocal relationship. This is an arrangement between two organizations that have the same type of hardware and possibly software. They agree to provide each other with facilities in case of a disaster. So you've got two companies and they have an agreement and says, you know, if one of us uh, has a disaster problem, we're going to rely on you to uh, create, you know, give us facilities, to give us support services to give us archiving areas, access to network and IT systems. This, this is going to tie into uh, the capacity management team greatly, making sure that you have the capacity to uh, be there for the other partner organization, not just so much are they going to be there for you. Remember, this is a, a bilateral relationship here. So Keep in mind that this option is not as attractive as it used to be because today there's so much distributed computing that it makes it very difficult for two companies to uh, actually share processing power, their high availability systems, and those type of things. Uh, another option is what we call cold standby. The cold standby option is known as gradual recovery. Okay, If a business can go without IT services for, let's say, 48 to 72 hours, you would have an empty computer room at an agreed upon fixed facility or a mobile facility, maybe a, maybe a mobile computing center, 
that comes to the business's site and you use this as a recovery option over the course of 42 to 72 hours. This is a cold standby option. A warm standby option is also referred to as an intermediate recovery option where you get access to a similar operational environment where your services can continue normally after a very short changeover period, typically 24 hours on the, lo on the low end to 72 hours on the high end. This option of warm standby really has three different scenarios. It has an internal, an external, and a mobile option. In other words, the warm standby facility is either internal at your campus, external off campus, or in a mobile facility, like a converted mobile home, for example, or a couple of tricked out vans. The hot start, hot standby option gives you immediate or very rapid recovery of services, typically in less than 24 hours. This is expensive because it provides an identical prototypical production environment. It basically mirrors the data and mirrors all of the systems and the services, possibly even uh, mirroring the entire production process in real time at the same time. And this would be, this would be a close cooperative venture with availability management, the hot start, hot standby option. Typically, most contingencies are going to use this final option here, which is a hybrid approach. Based on your budget, based on your resources, it'll be some combination, depending upon the department, depending upon the mission criticality of the service, or the infrastructure, some combination of cold standby and hot standby or hot start, combination of warm and hot, or maybe uh, a few areas have a reciprocal relationship. Maybe one area could go, can fall back on a paper-based system or a manual system, like HR, for example, could fall back on a paper-based system if they needed to for a week, a hybrid approach. These are all parts of your IT service continuity strategy. Let's go back to that diagram now. Returning back to our ITSCM process, we can see the third step implementation actually has six actions or six activities. The first is organization and implementation planning. Step two of implementation is to implement standby solutions. The third is to develop your recovery plans. Fourth is to implement risk reduction measures. Five, develop the procedures and six, do the initial testing of the implementation. Obviously, the first activity is a very crucial step in continuity management. Hopefully for your organization, planning, testing, and practicing is all you'll ever really have to do. You won't ever have to do a disaster recovery process because you'll be spared any disaster. That's what we're all hoping for. But some businesses and organizations will experience disasters. So all of this has to be put in place. There's really three tiers of recovery that are going to be looked at. First of all, you have to recover the executive tier, the executive level. That's the overall authority and control for all of the efforts. You've got a coordination tier, which is kind of the overall organizational deployment. Then a recovery tier. The recovery tier actually involves the individuals and the teams that are responsible for implementing the recovery plans that you develop here in this third phase. Organization and planning involves coordination planning, key support function planning, and recovery team planning. You'll also have several formal plans like the emergency response plan, a salvage plan, vital records plan, maybe crisis management and public relations. All these things have taken into consideration. Then you'll implement your standby solutions. This is assuming that you've got standby arrangements in existence. And this goes back to your IT service continuity strategy. What option have you chosen? If it's a hybrid option or a combination, which combination are you choosing? Cold site with reciprocal arrangements with some hot site. Okay, implementing your standby arrangements. Organizing all the standby facilities and the equipment, the infrastructure, managing your contracts and agreements with third-party individuals. These are your contingency options from stage two requirements and strategy. Then, of course, you'll develop your recovery plans. This is actually going to be a set of written plans that a steering committee or strategy team will put together. One of the main aspects of this a recovery plan is proving to the executives or the management that you can effectively execute 
all the deliverables of continuity management. So this may, this may take a little bit of campaigning, but you've got to prove that your plan is going to work in case of a disaster. Probably, probably you may be using case studies from past events, case studies from Katrina or information from FEMA, for example. And then, of course, this, the fourth option here is to implement your risk reduction measures. Um, again, this is going to be a balance. Remember, most organizations are going to be a balance between risk reduction measures and actual disaster recovery. Typical measures here would be things like providing power supply, fault-tolerant systems, failover systems, off-site archiving and storage, uh, duplicating data storage, duplicating applications, having spare equipment, spare modules, spare power supplies, those types of things. Then you'll develop the procedures in the fifth action here. Have all of the team members, all of your technical people, all of your IT people who are unfamiliar with systems, maybe to go through the process to practice restoring the systems. This could be a combination of awareness and training and getting into some lab scenarios where you train personnel to go through the, at the process and go through practice scenarios of restoring systems. You should have detailed procedures in place and available as necessary. And then, a, then finally here, the last aspect of implementation is the initial testing. This is the critical part of your overall IT service continuity management strategy. It's the really only way that you know that the strategy that you've selected, that your scope, that your BIA, that your risk assessment activities have been ad adequate and accurate, that your IT service continuity strategy options are correct, and that all phases of implementation have been properly put in place. You've got to do a logistical business recovery test and make sure that all of the procedures in place are actually going to work in the real world. And then finally, the fourth aspect is operational management, ongoing operational management to provide assurance to all people in the organization that you can survive a catastrophic disaster or a catastrophic failure. Since your organization is in a constant state of change and modification, that means your continuity plan also has to be changed as well because it can rapidly become outdated. Changing the level of resources, including it in all the major decisions of your organization, keeping service continuity relevant, pertinent, and ready. This kind of assurance is going to include education and awareness programs, ongoing training, review processes that review the business and IT and the synergy between IT, your business goals, and service continuity. Ongoing testing, maybe on a quarterly basis, a semi-annual basis, an annual basis. Tightly coupling service continuity with change control and change management. IT service continuity management should be a required and necessary aspect of your change management so that all of the changes will be reflected in planning and provisioning and in the change management database. Then, of course, this is all wrapped up in assurance. Providing the assurance and the near guarantee that the quality of IT service continuity management and your deliverables strategy is going to be acceptable and provide a sense of well-being and confidence for senior management. Well, this discussion certainly wouldn't be complete without a little analysis of the costs of putting together this service continuity slash disaster recovery solution and its potential problems. And as you can already tell, the costs of this solution are going to be great. This is one of those things in an organization, it's money that you spend that you may never actually recoup. It's money that you spend for peace of mind. You may not see a direct return on your investment, and you may not realize that return until a real disaster strikes. So the time it takes to put this in place, the financial resources it takes are extensive, depending upon your recovery options. Again, time and expenses for planning, for initiating, for developing, for testing, and implementing. All these things are extensive. You've also got to look at your risk management personnel. You have to train individuals or bring in third-party consultants or experts to help you put this into place. As I mentioned, if you're going to be dealing with a reciprocal arrangement, you'll have to have teams of people on both sides of this bilateral solution 
risk management team, software, and hardware in place. Also, there's the cost of your recovery arrangements, whether they're cold site, which is basically equipment just sitting there without operating systems loaded or applications loaded, basically servers and network infrastructure, maybe a warm site or a hot site. The hotter it gets, the more expensive and time-consuming it's going to be. Keep that in mind. Those are the costs, which are great, and there's also some potential issues. For example, do you have the resources available now and commitment from management and team leaders to put this recovery option in place? How does this fit into your budgeting strategy? Many times as you're creating your budgets, you think a lot about the existing equipment needs, maybe future growth needs, but sometimes we don't consider service continuity and disaster recovery as part of our budget. And this can be a huge aspect of our budget. And as I mentioned, many times we don't see the return on investment unless disaster strikes. That's why many organizations will just simply rely on insurance, willing to take that risk rather than spend the money. There's also problems in assessing the recovery sites themselves. Many times you don't actually get to fully test the recovery site before a disaster strikes. So there is some element of the unknown there. Do you have the ability to 100% assess your hot site or your warm site or your cold site? Or is a lot of this just going to be left to past experience and case studies when a real disaster strikes? There's also the, the problem that management is not committed to disaster recovery. As we said, some management just want to roll the dice and they're more willing to take risk. Are they, have they completely bought into the strategy or are they more risk takers? Another problem is when you actually have to use your cold, warm, or hot site option, those 24 to 72 hour delay processes turn into perpetual delays where you're going to uh, days and weeks and possibly even months. That can be a huge problem. The costs can skyrocket. It could bring your company down to its knees. Another challenge is that of black boxing. And the process of black boxing is where your IT service provider basically says, look, I have this agreement with you, but I'm going to abdicate responsibility and give up control to some of the third party. In other words, I'm going to outsource this to somebody else. The organization spent a ton of money on IT systems, on IT services, and it's outsourced a portion of the operations to a supplier or to a service provider. Management expects the money they've spent to ensure their recoverability, only to find out that this is part of it's been outsourced, which is going to cause greater delays, even perpetual delays. Another potential problem for companies is just simply the lack of in-house IT expertise, the lack of familiarity with recovery, the lack of experience with disaster recovery and continuity management. And then an overall corporate lack of business familiarity and awareness is also going to cause problems. Why? Well, if you have to duplicate or replicate your business in another site, either an off-site location or a mobile situation, and you aren't really familiar with the business or have an awareness of how the business works, you're going to have a lot of problems duplicating and replicating that business environment in another site. So these are key aspects, potential costs, and potential problems of IT service continuity management. Well, in the second to last Nugget movie of the ITIL version 3 series, we looked at four key topics. First of all, an overview of ITSCM, IT service continuity management. Oops, let me fix my T here. And then we looked at the different categories and types of disasters. We kind of went through a laundry list of those. You need to know that information when you put together your strategy. We looked at the four-phase process in great detail of ITSCM. And then finally, some of the costs and potential issues with deploying and implementing an ITSCM solution. I hope this CBT nugget has been informative for you. I want to thank you for viewing. We'll see you in the final nugget of the ITIL series.